begin our exploration of the phylum Arthropoda with an examination of a freshwater crayfish in the genus Camberis. Now these are members of the class Malacostrica and the order Decapoda, along with the familiar lobsters, crabs, and shrimp that you might find on your dining room table. In fact, decapod crustaceans are the only crustaceans you're likely to find there. Not a lot of people are eating roly-polies for dinner. That is, not a lot of people over the age of five. Now, the order decapoda encompasses a great deal of diversity. 8,000 plus species, ranging in size from this giant spider crab with a wingspan of eight to nine feet, down to the tiny pea crab that measures only a few centimeters across and is a parasite of bivalve mollusks. Now here we have our more moderately sized dissection specimens, two freshwater crayfish in the genus Camberis. Now already as we look at them we can see that it may be a bit easier to figure them out, a bit easier than it was to figure out the mollusk, because already here we can tell which is the anterior end, the head end, and which is the posterior end, the tail end. We also know that the dorsal surface is face up and that the ventral surface is face down. We can also see some major body regions here, the cephalothorax, which is anterior to the abdomen. One of the major features of the cephalothorax is the carapace, which is actually the exoskeleton of the head extended posteriorly to cover up the thorax, including the delicate structures of the feathery gills. We can also see some major appendages here. We have the big pinchers or kelopeds. And then we also have these four pairs of regular periapods, walking legs. If you add that all up, you have two kelopeds and you have eight walking legs. That gives you 10 total appendages here used for moving about. And that, of course, is where these decapod crustaceans get their name. Decapod means 10 legs. Okay, if we flip the crayfish over so that the ventral or belly side is up, we can see some other appendages. Down here on the abdomen, we have the swimmerette. Okay. Up towards the anterior end, we can see the antennae and the antennules. So uh, crustaceans have two pairs of antennae. That is one of their defining characteristics. Another of their defining characteristics is that they have biramous or two branched appendages. So down here on the tail, we see these uh, uropods, these tail appendages. And you'll see that it looks like we actually have two pairs, but we only have one pair because there are two branches. There's a single base, and then we have two distal branches to that. So this is a biramous uropod. So we have one on uh, the left, we have one on the right. Uh, in the middle is the unpaired telson, but you have those two biramous uropods on either side. We can also see this when we look at the swimmerettes a bit more closely. Each of these little swimmerettes has two branches. So here with this one, you can see very clearly uh, we have a single swimmerette there with two branches at the distal end. So here we have two crayfish, one male and one female, both ventral side up. The male is on the left over here and the female is on the right. The way that we can tell the difference between the two is by looking at the swimmerettes. The swimmerettes are the appendages that are attached to the ventral side of the abdomen. Now, when we look at the female, these are all feathery. So the swimmerettes are all feathery. But with the male, the first two pairs of swimmerettes are sclerotized. They're hardened for use as copulatory swimmerettes. They're used during mating for the transfer of sperm. And so looking at those copulatory swimmerettes is an easy way to distinguish uh, males from females. Okay, so the crayfish actually has a complicated set of mouth parts here. We have a range from the posterior end to the anterior end, three pairs of maxillopeds, two pairs of maxillae, and one pair of mandibles. This right here is the third maxilloped, uh, and then in front of that again you have the other maxillopeds, the maxillae, and then you have right here the crushing, chewing mouth parts, the mandibles. Now these are a bit hard to see. They're all kind of layered on top of each other here, mashed together. So we're going to pull them apart so that we can see them a bit more clearly. 
Okay, so here we have the mouth parts all laid out for you to see from the anterior end at the top to the posterior end at the bottom. The anterior most set of mouth parts are the mandibles, so one pair of mandibles that are serrated along the medial margin and that are used for crushing and tearing up the food. The first maxillae hold the food in place as the mandibles are chewing. The second maxillae have a specialized function related to aerating the gills. They have what's called a baler on them that allows them to move water over the gills. Uh, and then you have the first, second, and third maxillopeds, which help to hold onto and manipulate the food. The largest of these being the third maxilloped there at the bottom of your screen. So now we're going to take a look at the gills. The gills are hidden underneath the carapace. The carapace is the exoskeleton of the head projecting backwards to cover up the thorax. And the carapace protects the delicate feathery structures of the gills. It also creates channels through which the water can flow and circulate around the gills constantly. We've got a bunch of latex in here. We're going to pull that out. That's from the injection of the circulatory system. We'll pull that away so that we can see the delicate feathery gills. There they are. Okay, And each of those is associated with one of the appendages. Uh, so the appendages have external branches, but there's also uh, this internal branch of the gills that is hidden underneath the carapace, and you won't see unless you pull back the carapace. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at some of the truly internal anatomy of the crayfish. And to see this, I'm going to remove the exoskeleton from the dorsal surface on both the cephalothorax and the abdomen. And when I do that, I see three prominent structures that jump out at me. Up to the top of the screen there, you can see the extensor muscles of the abdomen that extend the abdomen, that stretch it out uh, to its full length. And then in the middle, you have the heart, the pumping organ of the open circulatory system of the crayfish. And at the front, you have, near the head, at the anterior end, you have the cardiac and pyloric stomachs. Okay. Now, we're actually going to open up uh, those stomachs because the contents are a bit more interesting than you might expect. You might think, well, I'm just going to find a bit of the crayfish's last meal, or I'm going to see an empty space. But no, inside, you're actually going to find... Uh, chewing structures called the gastric mill, these little chitinous teeth. So you thought you were done with mouth parts, uh, but no, hidden here in the stomach, the crayfish has a surprise for you. Uh, the gastric mill is composed of three chitinous teeth that come together to chew up the food as it's passing from the cardiac stomach into the pyloric stomach. Now this gastric mill is there, but it's hard to see in our specimen. So we're going to look at some other views of the gastric mill. This is from a different species, but a related one. Uh, and, and so the, the structure here is similar. In the left picture, you can see picture A, you see the cardiac stomach. Okay, then we're gonna open up that cardiac stomach and we see uh, what you have there in image B. These are the three uh, prominent teeth, chitinous teeth of the gastric mill that come together to chew up the food. Uh, C over there gives you a close-up look at one of those chitinous teeth uh, with their little ridges. Now the subject of this article was actually using these little ridges in order to determine the age of crayfish, which is always important in wildlife biology when we're trying to keep track of a population looking at the age structure of that population. So if we go back to our crayfish specimen, we can see a few more of the internal structures. I'm going to peel back the extensor muscles here. And when I do that, I see underneath the digestive glands up here, right, producing enzymes for the digestion of the food. And then we also see, heading posteriorly towards the tail end of the crayfish, the intestine. And the intestine will end, of course, at the anus. You can see the anus if we flip the crayfish over here. There it is right there, the hind end of the digestive tract. Now if we go back over to the dorsal side and we look uh, around that intestine, we'll see these big powerful flexor muscles that are used for folding the tail underneath, particularly important when the female is reproducing and we have eggs or offspring underneath there. All right, now we can also here look at a couple of more structures up at the anterior end. If we take out the stomachs, 
and we look in this head region where we see these two big prominent glands known as green glands. Those green glands are the excretory structures of the crayfish. And they have ducts that open out at the base of the antennae. Well, that's it for our dissection of Camberus. I hope you've enjoyed your look into the phylum arthropoda and into the anatomy and biology of this freshwater decapod crustacean. So long for now. Thanks for watching.